Okay, so um, this talk's probably going to be on the... If you, does anyone know, uh, it's probably sort of a long thing, does anyone know Maslow's hierarchy of needs? What we did in the last two was sort of survival, and the next one is on sort of uh, uh, luxury and comfort. But, uh, so this is Memristus, um, described by Leon Choi, it's a Malaysian name, so it's pronounced Choi, in 1971, in his seminal paper that sort of he made his money with, and his paper's called Memristus, the missing circuit element. I hope uh, yeah, this talk should sort of lightly blow your mind, because it's, uh, if, from everything you learn about circuitry, there's sort of this elephant in the room that you completely miss if you, if you look into the, into the fundamentals of circuitry a little bit better. So, yeah, uh, Leon Choi, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing, reason for existence, mathematics, how it's discovered, and some future applications of the memory stuff. So, you should all know this, I hope you all know this, this is Ohm's law, current to voltage, uh, the relationship made by a resistor there. Um, uh, obviously, we know this isn't the only thing that goes on in circuits, otherwise circuits would be a fantastic way to waste energy and do nothing. So, we have this, which you should know from the capacitance, the property called the charge in circuits, which, um, which is derived from Gauss's law. Um, it's related to the current by the time integral. Uh, you know, if you can think of a component that could possibly uh, relate the total amount of charge that's passed through a circuit and the total amount of charge that's passing through a circuit, I'd like to see you try because, as far as I can tell, it's time itself that manages that. Um, charge and voltage obviously related by capacitance. Um, but, you know, we know Maxwell's laws, we know about Faraday's law, so there's this quantity here called the flux, which we derive through Faraday's law. Uh, the flux, so we, we know the EMF, which is effectively the voltage, um, is the rate of change of flux nuclear. So for this reason, flux completely analogously to current and charge is the time interval of voltage. But also we know through Ampere's law, we can relate these two um, through, through an inductor. And it's, it, it's easy enough, you solve through the maths and you get this, you get this inductance L and it's used um, oh, with a coil. So great, that's everything, that's the yeah, first year secretary, done. Great, let's sort of go home, but we've got a gap. What goes there? I mean, surely, these are axiomatic laws, right? These come from nature, and we've, we've, we've derived these, they're, they're given their premises. Surely for the sake of completeness and for symmetry, there should be something here between the charge and the flux. And that's exactly what Leon Choi did in 1971. He postulated the memristor. So you've got the four key relations, resistor to V by the I, inductor uh, to phi by the I, capacitor to Q by the V. What should go here? There should be something here. And uh, yeah, that's the memristor. So the memristance, um, which is related to Q, is d phi by the Q. Um, since Leon Troy proposed this, would anyone like to guess what he called the unit for memory distance? Memory <laughs> He called it the Choi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, exactly what we should do, really. Um, so it's quite easy to get a nice, usable formula like this. Separate variables, do a time interval. And you get this familiar kind of looking formula. V equals I, M of Q. So this Q is the total amount of charge that's passed through the, the circuit. It's the time interval of the current. So what you've got here is you've got a voltage that is related to the total amount of charge that has passed through. You've got a sort of resistor with, with memory, um, which is very interesting indeed. So if we take our standard power formula, you know, IV, and plug what we got in, you get B equals I squared M of Q. And we can sort of see some of the properties of this by talking about what a memristor is not. A memristor is not the source of our energy problems. We cannot create infinite energy from this memristor. I mean, this P here is the, the power dissipated across the memristor. So if the memristance went negative in any way, it would start to create energy, and we know this probably is not the case, and we know it can't be the case. The memristor is a passive circuit element. That's what electrical engineers call them, which means it absorbs energy rather than creating it. Memristor is also not a superconductor, so that means M of Q here can't be zero. Uh, seems nice and easy enough. Also, um, you might sort of be thinking, but what if M of Q sort of shoots off when you create, when you're using up loads and loads of energy, waste the circuit? Well, in actuality this doesn't occur. We might see why this, I'm able to work it out why this occurs from when I talk about how you can actually make a memristor. Um, it creates a sort of hysteresis loop if you draw a, um, a v, VI graph. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm drawing one out here, but uh, 
if you have a, a VI graph, it sort of makes a bow tie shape. And we'll get on to why this bow tie shape is interesting when it comes to other things that were potentially discovered. So, this is, a, this is how you make a memorista if you can't make a memorista. This is called a mutator. This is a snippet from, from Choice, 1971 paper. Um, this is an active circuit, so it actually needs um, <coughs> input. So here you've got there and there's where energy comes in and out. There's about 30 components here. Um, what it does is it simulates a memorista across these two ports there, and you put a, um, you put a, a, res a resistor across here, it'll make one at the other end. Um, obviously it's a bit big, you can't be using this in your electronics really, considering there's about 30 components here. Let's see, because they're all numbered, right? So there's at least 12 resistors and that's nine, whatever these are, okay, transistors. Um, is that right? Those transistors are right here, good. So, a bit massive, takes some energy, a bit useless. So, Stanley Williams uh, is the leading member of the, of the team that in 2008 created the first proper memorista. His paper was called The Missing Memorista Found, and he did leave off the capitals, which is uh, well, forgivable given for what he did. So, this is how they did it. This is your memorista. It's fantastic. It's actually there. Um, it's created from titanium dioxide. What you have is you have a titanium dioxide between two ports here, or between two terminals. And um, you, so, so, so in theory, you, you, have this, you have this homogenous uh, substance, and you dope some of it with positive ions. So that uh, if you put a voltage across them, all the positive ions go to one end, and, and you're sort of left with these two different substances with different resistivities, which they labeled are on and are off. This again is a snippet from the paper. I sort of moved it around a bit for ease of reading. Um, but they, they use titanium dioxide. So throughout all this is titanium dioxide. When there's, when there's sort of a lack of oxygen, it's considered, it's considered doped. It's a, 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 charge of, a charge of 2Q missing. So you have these positive ions. Here, the, the width of the doped section is W. The width of the whole thing is D. Voltage across. So you have this through Ohm's law, or you know what, what we had before, which is um, easy enough to read, um, and then you have to define this this W of t, which is defined here. Uh, dW by dt is this is this constant, which uh, is related to how the how the doping can, can move around uh, R on a d and I of t. So you take a nice little time interval like we like to do, and you get uh, W of t is that formula there, insert into the top, and you make a sort of Approximation saying that R on, which is the uh, resist resistivity of this, uh, is much less than the resistivity of this. And you actually get a formula for the many resistance here, which is uh, M of Q <coughs> is that. And I maybe you might be able to see why it doesn't go on forever. Because uh, if the many resistance changes based on Q, it means that this is going to change. So this width is going to move, but it's going to become, you're going to have a lot more section of higher resistivity, so it's going to hit certain limits and it might, it might sort of pull itself back round into a bow tie shape. And that's not the only way of making a memorister, otherwise as well, spin systems, which I think Sonic might be talking about next, spin stuff, yeah, so I'm not going to talk about that, in fact I don't fully understand these. Um, the manganite films, somebody did an experiment with um, thin films of uh, oxygenated, oxygenated, sort of, op well, manganite oxide, don't know if manganite's an element, but essentially what they found is they found the bow tie shape uh, with the VNI, which is very interesting because they didn't explicitly say memorista. Uh, I think that was a 2001 paper, so that's quite good in that way. Um, there's this uh, system called resident tunneling diode, which I assume uses quantum mechanics. Uh, again, they found, this was, this, was a, this was in the 90s, they found this bow tie shape, uh, but they didn't, they, didn't, uh, they, uh, they didn't know what a memorista was, or they, or they didn't care, whatever. But they, 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 they didn't get it, and um, it's kind of, it's, it's a good hint that there might be a memorista occurring in this section. So that's fine, good, and great. But you know, what can we actually use these for? Because it's fine, it's fine. To, I mean, you can you can theorize anything, and, and you, you, you can make a little something. But if it's if it's, it's just a curiosity, if you can't use it. Well, obviously, being called the memorista. You can imagine there might potentially be some memory applications. So, and there are. Uh, memristors are essentially a competitor to flash memory, which we have at the moment, and, um, and also potentially a competitor 
to RAM as well. Um, there are three nanometers in scale. This HP. HP are the other company that did most of the work. The 2008 paper was sponsored by HP. They've got the intellectual property rights on memristors, as far as I'm aware, which is a shame because it means it won't come out to market as quick as it could. But uh, there, you, there you are. Um, so, so the three nanometers, transistors these days, about 25, they're hoping to, transistors are going to drop in scale to around 15 nanometers by 2013, but by then, memristors will be all over the place. So one wafer of, mem of, of memristors can create 20 gigabytes per centimeter squared. But and the thing is, I mean, that, that is not that impressive, right? Because you can get those micro SD cards that are 32 gigabytes and the size of your little finger now. But the thing about memristors is they consume much less power, uh, on an entire scale of magnitude less power than transistor stuff does. And this is good in that obviously things don't heat up, um, so you can stack them. And at the moment, HP have a plan for stacking memristors well, a thousand times. So you have a thousand stack, and you can, in one centimeter cubed of, of memristor systems, have a petabit of data stored, which is a phenomenal amount of data. It's amazing. Um, they're also more durable, just, you know. So, so obviously, like that, that's the main key, the core thing behind memory is how much you can store, but the sort of periphery things that are important. So they're more durable. Um, they're less susceptible to radiation damage. Uh, obviously, these things get smaller, so you've got, a, you've got a, a transistor that's 100 atoms long. If one gets hit by, say, an alpha particle or whatever, and sort of knocks out an atom, or or whatever it might do to damage it, it's, it's going to do a lot more damage if, if there's less atoms. And this isn't a problem for the memorister uh, to, such, to such an extent. It's uh, far more durable in that regard. So there are more applications for memory. This is my last slide. Um, synapse modeling. Um, it, seems, it seems to be the case that whenever um, a new technology comes out in circuitry, everyone says, yes, let's model the brain. But um, this one actually seems promising. Um, it's it's the, the the main problem with modeling synapses and, and, and neurons and neuromorphic systems is that each neuron is connected to ten thousand other neurons via synapses, uh, approximately. Um, which obviously you've got transistors next to each other. It's really hard to link them up to ten thousand other transistors. Uh, apparently, this issue is not a problem with memristors, so it allows for. That sort of behaviour. Um, in Troy saying he had a paper in 2009 where he's talking about these systems called mem capacitance and mem ductance. Don't fully understand them, but he says that that's that he sort of defined a neuron by these by these properties. Um, they recently managed to get memristors to behave in um, to model Boolean logic properly. So that's good for logic people and analog computing. Who would have thought? Uh, since the 1960s, analog computing died out after the birth and fantastic growth of digital computing. But um, memristors are essentially analog um, switches. So you can, either, you can either have them sort of intensely one or the other, or you can sort of zoom in and, and, and compute in an analog fashion, which is, I mean, analog computing uh, only really died out because, because of physical limitations. Um, but there you are. So with a new paradigm comes a new opportunity for something. That's a pretty good sentence to end. Uh, talk on, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex.